So welcome everyone. Very, very nice to have you here with us today. My name is Dora. I'm one of the organizers of Kesher. Um, Kesher is an initiative that we started uh, three and a half years ago. It's a project that we aim um, to introduce Jewish communities from all over the world, from all the continents, different cities, different countries. Uh, and uh, we do this by inviting speakers who are somehow very connected to a specific place and they share the history, the culture, and also the present day situation of their Jewish communities. So these are the events that we run mostly twice a week uh, for, for the last more than three years. Uh, but lately we started to have a special kind of event and this is what you are joining today. Uh, we realized that there are so many, so many stories uh, and there are so many ways to share these stories, of course, not only through our, our Zoom events, but there are many books that somehow relate to everything that we speak about in, in our sessions. And this is why we decided to start doing the Kesher Book Club in which we introduce more or less once a month a different book that somehow we feel that connects very much to our overall theme. And uh, today we are very happy to welcome Tirza Firestone who is uh, going to be the speaker of the day. She is a rabbi, a psychotherapist, and of course an author. And I know many of you already know her. She wrote the book called Wounds into Wisdom, which is about healing intergenerational Jewish trauma. So she's going to speak about her, her research and what drove her to, to write this book. And of course, she introduced to us what this book is about. So uh, I'm going to pass the word now to her. And if you have any questions, please put them in the chat and we will try to answer as many as possible at the end in about 45 minutes from now. So, Tirza, the floor is all yours. Thank you so much, Dora and Sebastian, for having me on this wonderful project. It's really an honor to be here with all of you. And it's so important these days, all the more important uh, to gather together, uh, just to feel each other's company, to feel each other's presence and solidarity during these, these troubled times. Um, and it's, uh, we're in a community. This is a community of learning and growing and making a journey. It's not a maybe a, a geographic journey, but a journey because Kesher is all about journeys and travel, right? But uh, a journey into new awareness and into new, new horizons. So because we are going to speak about sensitive things today and personal things and uh, touchy things that have to do with pain, I want to ask that we begin and go into a place of calm together, just to settle ourselves. So I'm going to invite you for just one moment to sit back in your seat, if you would, and collect yourself from wherever you came today or this evening, wherever, whatever part of the world you're in, so that we can calm ourselves just a bit and regulate our nervous systems to a, a relaxed and a relatively relaxed place given all that's going on in the world. So sit back if you would, and let's just take a moment to open up our, our breathing, slowing it down and spreading it out a little bit, elongating our, our inhalation. Exhaling completely. You might close your eyes for just a moment and feel yourself, feel your body, let your hands grow heavy right where they are. You don't have to change anything. Just let your hands be heavy. And that just that little bit, just heavy hands and each finger in its place, heavy, so you can feel each one of your fingers. As if each finger had a little drum beat in it, which it does, a little pulse. Beautiful, just feeling the pulse, the throb in each of your fingers giving yourself a loving command to 
relax, to center and to allow a root to go down far, far, far into Mother Earth as if you're opening the trunk of your body and letting it grow roots down, down, down. Beautiful. To stabilize and ground you like a big, big oak tree. Beautiful. Okay. And feel before you open your eyes, would you just feel the network as if we are a uh, a grove of aspen trees, a grove of oak trees that all our roots are interconnected, a community of, of life, a community of humans that are seeking life from underground, which is so beautiful. Okay, good. Gently open your eyes and just rub your hands together. We're going to go, I hope that we'll talk a little bit. I'll tell you some stories. I'll tell you about my work and about the book. And then at the very end, stay on because I'd like to, before we have some questions and comments, I'd like to just do one internal journey to close us out into the world of magic and possibility. So thank you for humoring me with that and hope you feel a little bit more centered in yourself. Today, I'd like to talk about a journey, the journey from wounds into wisdom, from the deep scars of historical trauma into new possibilities. Now, even though many of our, many of us are feeling that our hopes are dampened right now because of the world events and as we watch the unfoldings and what we might call a, a big contraction in the world, a big regression in the world, I am here to say today that we must hold forth the possibility and the hope that we can change, that we're not doomed to replay again and again for all time the curses of the past. The, 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 the ancient scars of the past have a momentum. They have a hold on us. And Wounds into Wisdom, this book, the research in the book, it brings, the, the book holds such hopefulness into what is possible, into real life people, true stories about people who have made this great journey, uh, who have done the big alchemical work of converting and transmuting their tragedies into gold, into the gold of new life and new futures. So um, as I don't need to say probably to anybody here, some of you have read the book already. Um, the book has been out for three years. It's just been reprinted in paperback and I just recorded it which was an extremely emotional experience. It's, it's, it's an audio book if you haven't, if you want to hear it because I'm able to animate or give life to the, to the voices of the incredible people that are in it. Uh, unfortunately, my research on the phenomenon of intergenerational or in Europe, we call it transgenerational trauma transmissions which means how trauma transfers from generation to generation, how it's physiological and epigenetic, borne out by scientific studies, just as it is borne out in our human souls for centuries. Um, the world is bearing out this phenomenon right now, that this is a fact, that it is not only what is happening here and now, but it is the raw intra-psychic nerves that we carry from our ancestors' unmetabolized work, unmetabolized pain, that makes what is happening here and now so much worse. So much worse. I could give you many, many examples. Probably everyone here uh, who's shown up here has examples of their own. 
the events of this autumn, this fall, right, right now, how they are made so much more painful because of historical traumas. So these events of our day are the tragic testimony, the proof to the to the science on the ground right now that unresolved, unmetabolized pain that is buried beneath the surface of consciousness does not simply evaporate. It does not simply go away, but that eventually it will it will demand breaking loose. It will demand oxygen. It will demand resolution. And that is both a a pain in the butt. It is it makes things worse, but it's also nature's way of saying we cannot go forever uh, putting things aside. We must do the hard work of facing into our pain and resolving it. Um, so much more on this in a moment. I'd love to uh, share some stories with you. First, let me tell you a little bit about myself, uh, just briefly. My own ancestry, um, an Ashkenazic Jew, my mother uh, escaped Nazi Germany in 1939 on the kinder transport as a teenager. She came full of her own, uh, her own history and her own family tragedy. All of her cousins, except for two, were murdered and uncles and aunts. So the family was devastated, but she and her siblings made it out and her parents miraculously made it out because I'm here. <laughs> I, I, I am testimony to that, to that miracle. My father was an American kid from Brooklyn who uh, enlisted in the U.S. Army and he was sent paradoxically over back to Germany to a prestigious bomb detection unit and found himself in Bergen-Belsen in 1945 as that death camp was being liberated. So he also was filled with, uh, filled with ghosts, filled with seeing the unseeable. And my siblings and I, the story is told, retold in the book, but my siblings and I uh, were filled with the unspoken secrets of both of them, the untold traumas uh, and tragedies. And it didn't matter really that, um, that they were not told, they came out anyway. They came out in mother's milk and in father's temper. Uh, what, what we saw as we unlocked his metal filing cabinet when uh, after he had died and saw the pictures he had taken as a young man, as a very young man uh, at, in the death camp, uh, that he had hidden away. It was so symbolic. He hid them away, and yet they were deep inside of him, and they transferred, these images transferred to us. That was one mystery. Why did they behave the way they did? Why was there that temper? Why was there that rigidity and those politics and that kind of parenting and the kind of desperate desperateness in, in uh, so much of what they did. And later, as I became a rabbi, I saw that same, those same patterns in many of the people that I, that I tended and ministered to. And uh, this hyper arousal, this kind of sense of fidgety um, anxiety, also a sense of unsurety of where do I belong here? Do I belong on in the world? The sense of unsafety. Uh, there were these prevalent patterns that I would see in my clients as a, as, a, as a psychologist, but also as a rabbi working with many, many hundreds of families intergenerationally. And then I also was traveling to Israel and uh, with a group called Rabbis for Human Rights, a beautiful group, which is uh, become true ah uh, in the United States, but is still known as rabbis for human rights in Israel, uh, given to justice, given to fairness, given to living the principles of Judaism. And we were traveling and doing tours regularly, say twice a year to uh, the West Bank. And, <clears throat> and there too, I saw, wow, what is the mystery that is going on? This that the politics aren't resolving, that peace is not coming. What is this? And it, it all of this conspired together 
into, into this book, <laughs> which is answering the question that of, of, of this riddle, the riddle of what is it that we carry within ourselves as Jews, but not only as Jews, as any ethnicity who has lived through and carries the burden of historical trauma and ethnic trauma, uh, collective trauma as the word, the term is now, um, that shifts our psychic, our collective narrative, it shifts our psyche, it shifts our behaviors. And, um, and the, the, so the book is an answer to that. And I went on a quest, a quest to see could, our, could these traumas be reconciled? Could they be healed? Is it possible that someone who has lived through, that people who have lived through enormous trauma and tragedy, could that be surmounted and healed? So that's what's in the book, many, many stories. And they're stories of heroes. They're my heroes. These are people who are still alive in many cases. Um, they're uh, people like you and me, young and old, and people who have lived through, or their ancestors, their, their parents or grandparents lived through unbelievable things. And that made an imprint in them and how they worked with them. Let me tell you a couple of stories now. And um, I'll begin, I think, with, a, with actually a story that's from my, my research, but not in the book. It happened after the book came out already. Uh, a young woman in her early 30s uh, who, told, uh, who told us that her very first memory in this life was a recurring dream from before she could even talk. A very strong dream that would happen maybe, I don't know, every week or twice a week for until she could talk. So from the very beginning, she had this deep imprint and, and in the dream, she was following, she was, she was watching from above a, an old train station where a man is standing on the platform of the train as if waiting for a train and jumping from the platform into the tracks. And the train is taking off. He's chasing it. He's running after the train as fast as he could possibly run, running for his life, running with all of his might and yelling and crying and screaming, please stop, stop, stop the train. I'm coming, I'm coming. And he's running and running and tears are flying and he doesn't catch up. The train takes off and becomes smaller and smaller. And he is just filled with emotion. And that's when the little girl wakes up. Hmm. And she cries each time. She cries each time, at, like a ritual. Her mother dashes into her room, picks her up out of her crib, sits in the rocking chair and comforts her. Well, finally, this girl, now a woman tells that she's able to, as maybe at the age of three or three and a half, able to tell the story of what she is seeing all these times. What is she seeing? And she tells the story to her mother about the man who's running after the train and he can't, he can't catch it and he's bereft and he's crying and, she, and her mother starts to cry. And her mother is like in chagrin and saying, how is this possible? How is it possible that you know this story? Nobody told you this story. We've never spoken of this story in our home. This is the story. This is the secret story of my father, of my father, your grandfather, his first family. He comes back. It's in the war. He comes back from the black market where he's trying to get food and his door is open, his family is gone. The Gentile neighbors say, hurry, hurry to the train station. They rounded up all the Jews. And he rushes with all his might to the train station and he jumps from the platform into the tracks and racing after the train, which he can never catch up to. His family is taken, he never sees them again. And this mother is the second family and this young woman who is now a millennial, I suppose you would call her a millennial, is 
with that dream. And she is part of a three gen, 3G group, they call it 3G, a third generation of Holocaust survivors who are millennials and talk about their grandparents' imprints in them. And when I was so aghast at hearing that story, because it was such a, because there is no science actually <laughs> that can record how a dream, how a, a that how a a trauma can pass into the psyche of a new generation uh, and into the dream life of a of a, a a young person. When I was so aghast, she she just shook her head and said, "Oh, this is not this is not nothing." remarkable at all. We all have dreams like this. We all feel our grandparents' histories in ourselves as if they're alive. And she didn't know any of the science or anything. She was just trying to, and she was a remarkable and healthy, healthy uh, young woman. So that's just a story about, that's very, very graphic about how uh, the, the deep, extreme events in a life can pass from generation to generation, even when they are secret, especially when they're secret. In fact, um, there are such um, amazing Dan Baron and Dori Laub, some fantastic traumatologists from Israel talk about uh, the traumas pass in particular when they are secret. They have more power intrapsychically. I'll tell you one more story. Um, and this one is also actually a young woman, a graduate student who, um, I won't say much more about it, but who I know, um, who now lives in Israel. <laughs> um, so uh, I start by, and I'll read from the book, uh, which looks like this, the, the new book, the, which, which has a study guide in it now, which I, I like very much, the paperback version. Robert J. Lifton, who is a, one of the great, great uh, traumatologists in the world today, says that all survivors of trauma undergo a struggle to give form or meaning to an otherwise incomprehensible experience and above all to their survival. And there's evidence that the offspring of survivors must undergo a similar struggle. This was the case of Monica a graduate student in her mid twenties who came to a Jewish ancestral healing retreat that I led and later sought me out to tell her family's story. Monica was engaged to be married the following summer and she worried that her quote, irrational fear of abandonment might ruin their otherwise healthy relationship. Why did she always expect the worst? She had extreme anxiety and often experience a sensation of deep dread. She talked about the dread that she carried in her body, especially when she felt disconnected from people she loved. Now that's very important, remember that. Later in graduate school, in a psychology project, Monica began researching her family more closely. And she said, I found a video that my uncle made of my grandmother four months before she died. Now, her grandmother was someone who had escaped the ghetto, um, also an Ashkenazic Jew. She escaped the ghetto and lived in the woods with her mother and sister. And unfortunately and tragically, they caught her grandmother and, or I'm sorry, her mother and, and sister, and they were shot. And so she is waiting, or the grandmother was waiting in the woods for the return of her family. I found a video that my uncle had made of my grandmother, Monica is saying, and as I sat there listening to her, I was shocked to hear her say these words. I'm always scared. I expect the worst. If you say you're coming and then you don't come, I can't take it. Monica exclaimed, I couldn't believe my ears. Those were my exact words. I had never heard my grandmother say them until after her death the same words that I used with my fiance when he was late. If you say you're coming and you don't come, I can't take it. I always expect the worst. 
at that moment, I said to myself, oh shit, <laughs> excuse me. My anxiety is so much bigger than me. And ever since I started noticing more patterns in my siblings and in myself. So I won't, I won't go any farther, but just to say that these, these uh, imprints are profound, uh, they are deep, and um, there are so many, many stories. Now in the book, we're not only talking about the Middle East, uh, we're not talking only about Russia or so many uh, things that happen in the world. So many of the things that we are suffering right now in this day and age have roots in the past. I think we all know that they have roots in the past. Uh, but we're also not only talking about global events, we're talking and thousands of miles away, we're talking about things in our own families and in our own bloodlines uh, and, in, and lineages that are unresolved, that are painful, that are secrets. The people from around the world that I interviewed for, for Wounds into Wisdom who were able to make the leap into uh, into becoming moral leaders, into changing their lives, into becoming profound souls, uh, had had certain things in common. And that's the second half of the book. The common denominator is that they all said the same. They all mentioned seven things. I counted seven things, which I made into seven principles of trauma healing. And I'll just name a few of these right now. The first is facing into our losses. We can't do anything unless we literally uh, just accept and face into what has happened to us, our losses. If we try to turn aside, if we bury them underground, if we ameliorate them by saying, oh, everything's okay. If we really face into it and grieve our losses. So that's number one. And the second is to harness the power of our pain, to harness the power of our pain. One of the great speakers in the book, Rami el Hanan, talks about the pain of losing his daughter to a terrorist attack, to a, a suicide bomber when she was 14 in Jerusalem was like nuclear power. And he said he could use it to destroy the whole world <laughs> around him, or he could use it to produce light and heat and put off a glow that would help and uplift. So the second, the second thing is to harness the power of our pain and use it for good to the best of our ability um, we have to face our buried resentments, the secrets in our families, face past relationships which have not healed, and unbury them. Because when we do not do that, when we do not harness the power of our pain to do that work, which is very, very hard work, they will act like an undertow. That's the image I always get is that they pull us down from beneath the surface of consciousness an undertow on our energy and on our health and on our just general well-being. Um, I'll mention a couple of other of other things um, that that they all said that seem very very salient right now, very relevant right now. Resisting the call, there is a natural call. I think it's an animal call within us to fear the other to blame the other and to dehumanize the other. And when we dehumanize the other as the cause of our pain, as the victimizer, we are the victim and they are the victimizer and they are the cause. When we dehumanize or put them behind a wall, when we, uh, when we call, when we globalize and say they are all like that or these people are animals or they are vermin. When, when we do these, when we allow ourselves to speak like that, to language such things, which is in our nature to do, um, when we don't resist that call, we are, as a human species, we are, we are, we're sunk. Uh, we are in trouble because then horrible things can happen when the other side, when the other is faceless. 
so to speak. And, and, and coming out of that, another one that all of these amazing people said is we must not, we must learn to disidentify from being a victim. Yes. Uh, they lost children and, you know, in wars and to suicide bombings, and they lost whole segments of their life to, uh, to heinous acts, atrocities, and injustice. But when we get stuck in victimhood, when we get stuck as a victim of trauma, as a victim of rape, as a victim of war, or a victim of displacement, or any of those things, when that becomes my identity, then I am caught in a, a shell that is un that is no longer alive. It's no longer moving and growing and 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 breathing. And that is really the end of our evolution, so to speak. And I'll say one more, examining, now many of you are, as I am a Jew, but not all of us, but it doesn't matter. In, in Judaism, we have a very strong trope that's very ancient and it comes from uh, biblical sources uh, and prophetic sources about being chosen, being a chosen people. And the question is, what are we chosen for? <laughs> um, I, I want to, in the book, I crack that open and talk about this identity, which can also be the other side of the coin to victimhood. We're special, we're superior, we're also scapegoats. And how that works and it flip-flops uh, and how that trope or that identity of being special, whether it's you're Jewish or not, whether it's I'm special because I have a superior anything, intelligence or talent or aptitude, or uh, I see the world in this way. When, whenever we hold ourselves as superior or chosen or special, we find ourselves uh, in a very, very difficult place. And it's, uh, keeps peace from happening. It keeps healing from occurring. And I talk all about that. <laughs> and again, these are not from me. These are from the many people, the many stories that I tell of these remarkable people. The final one I'll just say is not gonna be a surprise to anyone, it's taking action. When we have had suicide in our family, when we have had, when we've lost a child, when we have gone through the trauma of losing a a body part or losing a, a whole career or losing a home, whatever it is. And then we feel so deeply, we are moved so deeply, we must take action to prevent those things from happening to others. And there's a natural impulse in us, uh, a, hum a beautiful human impulse to give to others. Uh, so, if I have suicide in my family, which I do, and I tell about this in the book, uh, there's a natural aptitude that I have to feel into the families who are grieving from children or siblings or parents who have taken their own lives. And that is a way that I have of taking action to, to use my trauma, to use my pain, to transcend it. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna invite all of us to take a breath again and come back together. And if you have a comment to mark to a chat in the chat column, and uh, if you would uh, like to do that right now, or make a mark in your journal. But in any event, to take a breath because I like to use the last few minutes that I have before I turn it back over to Dora and Sebastian uh, to take you on a very brief journey. Okay. So once again, if you would, I'm just going to, if you don't mind, I'm going to put this on gallery view so I can see all of you. It's lovely that you've come in the middle of the day or night. And uh, I'd love for you to Sit back again, regather your energies. Remember talking about these things is not easy. 
And so I want you to give yourself a little comfort, however that is, place your hands on your tummy or on your heart. And then relax so that we can open some inner doors and journey on an inner plane inside the vast world that's inside of us. So would you just rest your hands again? And allow them to be heavy wherever they are. Spreading out your breath, maybe to a count of four, breathing in and out. As your hands grow heavy on your lap or on the chair next to you, I want you to let your exhalation go down that root system and into Mother Earth. Just imagine that. You're inhaling, maybe breathe it out your mouth and breathe it, exhale it down the root system, out the bottom of your trunk into Mother Earth where it can be neutralized. And one more time, breathe in. And relaxing your shoulders and your belly on the way down, pouring out carbon dioxide into Mother Earth where it belongs. And then would you close your eyes and relax another notch as we invoke the power of transcendence that lives in each and every one of us, the magic of possibility that lives inside of you. Even when we feel flat, even when we are troubled. Okay. So today, like no other day that has ever existed, that's what the Holy Ari says, today, this moment, like no other moment that has ever existed, and you are like no soul that has ever existed. No one has ever been here in all the millions and billions of souls who have come to planet Earth. No one has your exact, precise genetic structure and epigenetic uh, wiring and no one has your aptitude. No one has your view, exactly your talents. So it's just about feeling the preciousness of this moment and all the help that we have from invisible sources, which you will not read about in the newspapers or in any books on current events. That comes from the insight. Line. With your next three breaths, I want you to call to you now someone from history, someone from perhaps your bloodline, but not necessarily your bloodline, someone from history that you have read about or heard about, seen their picture, possibly you've even known them. Someone on the other side of this life, this earthly life, who holds magic, who holds possibility for healing, for transcendence, holds the possibility of hope. Relaxing, allowing a face or a figure to come to mind. It might be a grandmother or a teacher or rabbi. It could be a friend who has passed. Who wants to come to you today? With a morsel of hope. 
as we say in Hebrew, it's seda laderach, come with some nourishment, some sustenance for the hard journey of being alive right now. Be patient and just let someone come. You'll know it's happening because you'll have a feeling, a felt sense, a yes. And ask or just present any question or difficulty you may be feeling and let them tend to you. And share anything, any message. Maybe just by virtue of their showing up, it's all you need. Breathing in. And breathing out. Receive their message, receive their love, receive their blessing for the challenges of being alive right now. What do you need? What magic, what possibility, what hope do you need to keep alive in yourself? How will you do that? One thing is sure, we need each other, both living and no longer physically alive. So now when you're ready, if you would just make a gesture of gratitude or honor, a little bow, perhaps. A namaste, blow a kiss. Allow this ancestor or wise and well being to recede back to their abode and make a note if you'd like or come back into your hands and I would like to ask you to rub your hands together and come fully back into your extremities, wiggle your toes and place the warmth from your hands somewhere on your body that would like that healing energy right now. Please don't worry if nobody came. It takes a little while to cultivate these muscles. It doesn't mean nobody is there. That's very important. Okay. Come fully back in to our circle of squares, and I will turn it over to you, Sebastian and Dora. Thank you so much, Teresa. Thank you for, for sharing all this with us. I, I'm sure that everyone is a little bit touched now, but we'll try to <laughs> come back, um, come back to to all of us now with with some questions. Um, 
I want to let everyone know that tomorrow we're going to send out a follow-up email in which we will include Tirza's website and also where you can uh, find the book. And there is also a lot of extra resources um, on her website. So we will uh, we will make sure that you will receive it. And I see that there are a few questions regarding um, people that were mentioned and uh, the audio book and all this. So we will... So these questions we will address in our follow-up email, and now we will um, uh, save the the time for for a, a bit deeper questions. Um, so I want to read the the first question. It's someone who actually read your book, um, and she speaks about a chapter in which you say that um, that trauma can also be healed through community. And what if what was your trauma is the Jewish community? What if the Jewish community transmitted the trauma to you and then abandoned you? Um, what if the community is not the answer for healing? So if you could address this. Thank you, Dora. And thank you to the questioner. It's a very sad question, actually. It makes me, it makes me sad to hear. I know that that is true. I know that it happens. The community can, can be cruel. Uh, when we are caught up in perhaps in belief systems or uh, principles, dogma, dogmatic principles that uh, that that uh, resist our human quest. Um, my first book was all about that, with roots into heaven, um, with roots in heaven. Sorry. Um, what I would say is that you're in community anyway. You're in this community. You're in this this Zoom community, we are together. And whether it is the community that we grew up in, which often, most often it's not, once we have endured trauma, and I say this in the book, uh, that we often need to find a different community, a different family, family who understands where we are coming from, family that understands what we've been through. And that is often not our biological family. Sometimes we have to leave our biological family and go on a search, go on a quest. So please, please don't feel alone. We are, we, many of us are going through what you're going through. And um, it's not, it's not, uh, it's not completely unusual uh, for someone who's gone through something very, very intense to feel alone, to feel like nobody understands and that you're doing your work alone. But even here today, we're together and so many of us understand uh, this quest. So I just want you to feel the roots that are all interconnected underground. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, there was a question um, about your book, if you talk about biological markers of trauma passed on. Yeah, biological markers. Uh, there's a, a relatively new field uh, of uh, an outcropping of the field of genetics called epigenetics. Epi meaning above or upon genetics being the DNA strands. And this is uh, the new science that began with animal science and now is very much in the human, uh, in to human research that charts generational patterns. Uh, let's say a great grandmother or a grandmother was a part of the, the mass uh, starvation that Russia did, uh, I believe it was in the forties in Ukraine or the Dutch hunger winter in 19, the winter of 1942 and 43, I believe, in the Scandinavian countries where, uh, where women were literally carrying children and they were starving. And so uh, even then in the 40s, it was understood that, uh, that those children would endure difficulty. They would be smaller embryos, they would be smaller infants but they did not understand that what we now know because we have three and now four generations, hence that the, the predisposition for PTSD, for emotional unhealth and mental unhealth, for depression, uh, not to mention uh, heart disease and obesity and physical uh, issues, 
these markers are like methylation upon the or on the DNA strands that don't change the genetic structure, but they mark the genes so that the genes are they uh, the genes are limited in how they express themselves. So issues of resilience, issued propensities for PTSD, uh, these are. Uh, spoken of in, and I'm happy to give more references to studies. Um, you can read about this in uh, in several books, and I'm happy to give that to Dora and Sebastian, and we can um, I can give you more. But uh, but also, it's in Wounds into Wisdom, and it's in lay terms because I'm not a scientist, and I don't expect you to be. So um, there's a lot of references in the book. Thank you. Another question, how can you learn to heal if you don't know and cannot find ancestral information? Yeah, so we're living in this amazing time when, uh, you know, there's two things. I'm sort of, uh, I'm I'm spiritual uh, and I um, have, I, I believe in the interconnected web, the echad, the, the unity of all things. So on the one hand, when you are really committed to learning about your ancestors and you start the work of saying that I want to know more, um, miraculous things start to happen. Uh, you'll get a call out of the blue or you'll get a box of letters, which happened to me from, from the war between my parents. Uh, um, amazing things start to happen when you put out the call or make the prayer, I want to know more. But there's also, and by the way, dreams are incredible. But uh, that's my that's my bias as a Jungian psychotherapist. There's also there's also amazing online uh, search engines now, like Ancestry.com, uh, like Twenty uh, Three and Me, of course. Um, there's many more Genie.com. If you're wanting to do a search, there's so much that you can get off of just putting your name and a couple of names of ancestors they can fill in. Um, the Mormons, by the way, have unbelievable research into uh, not Mormon, but Jewish and other ethnicities, uh, genealogies. Uh, so the other thing that I would say is if there's any elder in your family, if maybe you have a great second cousin or a great uncle or aunt, and you can find them, track them down and interview them, call them, visit them, interview them, record them, and you'll start to hear things. Uh, it's really, really important that we know our elders and that we know their stories. So have hope, have hope. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, could you please speak to your experience of reconstructive memory and its impact upon people? I would need to know more about what this person means. Reconstruct okay. I, no. I was also not sure, but I thought if you might know. But then, um, so uh, there was- It also could mean so many things, but I'm not sure I, I know what they mean. Okay, <laughs> no problem. Uh, Robin, uh, would you like, I saw that you had a comment and you also wrote that you would like to ask a question. I don't know if, uh, which one of the two, but if Robin, you'd like to unmute then we can give a, a very- quick uh, moment. Thank you. Um, I recently participated in a Zoom video, which a therapist led, in which she described the different generations that I'm a baby boomer. So I grew up knowing about the Holocaust. But the theme of the talk was that kids in college age, Jewish kids, were raised differently than we were that the idea of Israel, they take as a, it's just there. They yep. don't appreciate the Holocaust. And because of this, there are lots of fights within families about supporting the Palestinians. Equal justice for all is how they were raised. The second part of this is something that happened to me right after Trump was elected. I went to the two young rabbis at our temple. This is in Washington, D.C. And I said to each one separately, I said, you better prepare the children for waves of anti-Semitism. And they looked at me like I was 
crazy. Well, they'd both grown up in upper middle class Jewish homes. They'd led a very Jewish life reform and they didn't know what I was talking about, but it was clear to me. That's it. That's all I'm going to say. Okay. That's great. Robin, thank you. A lot of wisdom in that question. Uh, History. (laughs) It really pays to know history. Some youngsters do, uh, but there is in regard to, to Israel and the unfoldings there, uh, and 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 I would say Ukraine and Russia as well, some of the crises and the crisis of democracy here in this country in the U.S. I know not everybody is from the U.S., but, you know, there is a big contraction happening in the world right now toward uh, ethno, ethno-nationalism, toward pre-fascism in some countries. Uh, it really pays to know history. Young people who have grown up uh, post World War II um, in the latter generation have grown up not un, not knowing anything but equality and justice for all, exactly as you're saying. And so uh, that is, by the way, I just heard a wonderful podcast by Ezra Klein uh, and Rabbi Sharon Browse. Uh, you might want to look at that, where he talks about the three responses to the unfolding Israel crisis in the older generation, in the middle generation, like 40s to 50, and then in the younger university crowd and uh, millennials and younger, and and how uh, drastically that is, you know, there is a divergence, the disparity in viewpoints. But that's why it's so important to know our elders. That's why it's so important to know history, to read history. So- um, May I make one little comment? Sure. When I was in my late 30s, I came to live in Washington and I was working for the, one of the companies that made rockets for Israeli airplanes. Actually, I was working for them in Israel just before that. And the two of the people I was working with made me feel so uncomfortable. And I it got it built up and built up and built up. And I said to a friend of mine, every time I have an interaction with them, a a voice tells me, this is what it was like in the camps. That's it. Yeah, I hear you. I hear you. Thank you. Do we have time for one more comment or question? Uh, Sure. Did did you, because there are, a few coming in. Um, so do you have one specific in mind or would you like me to choose one? Oh, I didn't. I, uh, okay. yeah, go ahead. Um, so I, I apologize from everyone that we just don't have time for, for, um, all the questions. Uh, but, uh, we want to let you know that there are options to go deeper and to connect with Tirsa also. She will have a course starting in December, uh, that we will send out information about so you can also join her there and uh, so there will be many possibilities um so I'll just now quick uh, uh, <laughs> pick quickly a question which will be our last one for today um as trauma awareness has entered popular culture I have seen it used as a way of dismissing genuine concerns that's just your trauma speaking how do we address this that's an excellent question. Uh, it's just your trauma speaking. And then we dismiss one another. And actually, when uh, any any philosophy can be used, and there's always the dark side, the shadow side of any philosophy or any truth. And uh, that is a way of uh, it's a it's a defense mechanism, I would say. it's a, it's a way of putting up a wall and saying, I, I don't want to hear what you have to say. I don't want to feel what you are feeling. And uh, and so we shrug and we just say, yes, of course. Uh, you know, I don't think it's important to fight with people who are putting a wall up. I don't think that they're going to hear anyway. So that would be my uh, you know, there are there are more important things to do than to uh, than to try to break through somebody's defensive wall. Um, but when there is an openness uh, to hearing, then that's where we 
need to step forward and speak heart to heart. I mean, I think it's really right now all about speaking from the heart and to the heart and to uh, bracket what we're saying as this is my experience. This is my heart speaking. I don't mean to say to anyone what you need to feel, but this is my truth. And then it, and then we have a, 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 a kind of container in which we are not hurting anyone. And we are also, we are imper, impervious to their uh, dismissals. I guess that's what I would say. It's a, it's a, it's a hard question, but a really, really good one. Anyway, thank you all so much. What a wonderful, intelligent gathering this has been. And and Dora and Sebastian, deep bow to you. I want to come and travel with you in the <laughs> world. May we all get to travel freely again and enjoy each other's company. Thank you so much, Tirza, of course. And thank you that you will be lovely. And thank you again for sharing uh, these stories with us and your book with us. And 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 your knowledge and your enthusiasm and your your peacefulness. It was really, really lovely to have you here with us. And thank you everyone for for joining. We we really hope that you also uh, had had a very nice hour with with us and Tirza here. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, we will send you tomorrow the recording of this talk and also um, the website of Tirza and and a few more follow up resources that you've asked in the in the chat. We will try to look for everything that you've asked for and include it in the in the follow up email. So thank you again. We wish you a wonderful rest of the day, wherever you are, or good night if you're uh, on this side of the world with us in Europe or Israel. Uh, and uh, we hope to see you soon. And happy Thanksgiving for all celebrating. <laughs> Bye, everyone.